Welcome to our Tuesday show. One of the great things about Tuesday is what we're about to do now. Yeah. Uh, talking to a man who is a Pulitzer Prize winner. He's a four-time best-selling author. He wrote the book literally. Then he wrote two other books on Trump. He's oftentimes called the Trumpologist. He certainly got a PhD in Trump. And when it comes to where the money is and where government uh, – acts uh, on behalf of wealthy donors. David's an expert in that area as well. Uh, he's the co-founder of dcreport.org. He's David K. Johnston. Hello, sir. Hello, Mark. I got to tell you, your cup came, but you got to oh. be left-handed. You got to be left-handed for the audience to see. Oh, no. <laughs> well, yeah. Maybe it's time that you develop that left side. Maybe that's that a, was my a brother. good thing. He was left-handed. <laughs> no, well, I'm glad you got the mug, and then you're so much a part of our show, and you're really loved by the audience as well. So, uh, look, the Dominion case is about to begin. We we talk about you and your granular knowledge of this guy Trump, and um, this is related to his election claims that were picked up by Fox News Channel. And then, of course, they ran with it, despite the fact that they it's been demonstrated now in recordings that they clearly knew that this was, you know, these weren't facts. Can you give us a sense of what you expect in this? It's a six week trial, right? Yes. The judge in this case, which is being held in Delaware because Fox News, like many, many other companies, is a Delaware corporation. It both helps them avoid paying state taxes they just, anything that would be taxable, for example, in New York, or as much as they can, they uh, pay to the Delaware headquarters on paper uh, as a management fee uh, so that they, in, in Delaware, corporations aren't taxed. And secondly- is that, uh, David, is that, a, is that a scam, maybe small S on scam? I understand it's legal, but isn't that, is, that, is that in kind of incentivizing in a way that it, 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 what are your thoughts on that? Well, California has tried to address this for years. I, you know, I left California 34 years ago, 35. So I'm not sure that I remember exactly. But California used to have a three-way measure of your profits. Here's what your total sales were. Here's what percentage were in California. Here's your total assets. Here's the percentage in California. Here's your something else. Here's the percentage in California. Now pay us X percentage of tax. Uh, but as long as we have a system in which the states are co-equal to the federal government, except for where the Constitution says otherwise, we're going to have this. You don't have that issue in Canada because provinces are creatures of the federal government, not co-equal. But in anyway, any many corporations use uh, either Florida or uh, Wyoming uh, or Delaware as their headquarters for tax purposes. And so that's where you would sue them. And the advantage uh, to corporations in this beyond taxes is that the judiciary there is deeply familiar with corporate law, uh, especially in something called chancery court. Uh, in this case, the judge in the case has already found that there was defamation. That is that Fox uh, said things that damaged Dominion voting systems uh, things that it knew not to be true, which is the basic definition of actual malice and reckless disregard, the standard you have to meet. And the trial is essentially about how much in damages, including punitive damages, should be awarded. Uh, Fox, has, sorry, Fox has very little chance of coming out of this with anything but a huge damage award, what they'll do then is appeal that it's excessive, no matter what it is, unless it's $1. And their hope is that they can get up to the Supreme Court, which takes a tiny fraction of appeals cases in the federal system. But if they get it there, their assumption is that the uh, Trump appointed judges and Sam Alito and maybe Chief Justice Roberts will align with them and perhaps even en enact new law that will protect people who lie, like Fox Notes News, while damaging people who do their best to tell the truth, like, you know, almost every other news organization in the country. Uh, that's interesting. So this is really a long game. This Dominion six-week uh, display legally is really just the first step on what will likely end up being an appellate process to the Supreme Court. Well, I don't know if they'll get to the Supreme Court. That's a very risky proposition. It's, it's odds that are 
they're not as like winning the Mega Millions lottery, but they're pretty bad odds. Um, uh, meaning the court is, the, is not likely to pick up the case. That's what you mean. Right. And, and Mark, this is the first really significant defamation case involving a news organization since Times v. Sullivan in 1964. That's a case in which a group of people who were uh, in the civil rights movement bought a full page ad in the New York Times. So it wasn't a newsroom in the New York Times, it was a full page ad. There was a factual misstatement, frankly, a pretty minor factual misstatement, but an undisputed factual misstatement in the ad. And the police commissioner of Birmingham, Alabama sued. And the Supreme Court ruling, which was consistent with, but very much strengthened the previous uh, uh, jurisprudence on this issue said, when you're a public figure, so not some poor private citizen who gets dragged into a news event against their will, but an elected official, uh, a celebrity, a movie star, I'm a public figure, like it or not, so are you. Kim, probably, but, but perhaps she could argue <laughs> against that. Um, the, the, um, uh, the standard is that not that there was an error, because we want robust debate. The standard the court set was you knew the truth and lied about it. You deliberately ignored the facts and said something that wasn't true. That's exactly what's happened in the Fox case. And you displayed, if you if you didn't know, a reckless disregard. That is, the person you're you're telling a news story about was standing right in front of you, and you never asked them, well, did you rape these three uh, kindergarten children? And then you reported so-and-so raped the kindergarten children. Uh, that would be reckless disregard. And there's a lot of concern that this court may move in the direction of what Donald Trump wants. Donald Trump has said repeatedly, news organizations should not be allowed to write anything about him that he doesn't approve of. Well, that's not a free country. That's a dictatorship. That's what's happened to the Wall Street Journal reporter who's been arrested by Putin's people um, for what apparently was a story that would have made Putin look good. Yeah, that's a weird uh, case. It almost feels as though that's out of the Brittany Griner world where... Oh, yeah. Oh, this is know. this is definitely, this was a, it's a reason I wouldn't set foot in Russia and from the time Trump was elected until now because of all the critical things I've written about Putin and about the war. Uh, you know, the, uh, I saw today the in Syria what they did to that journalist as well, American journalist tortured and... Um, uh, ultimately died, and they're trying. They're looking yeah. at uh, bringing uh, Syria up in, before the international court because of it. So uh, look, and we talk from time to time on this show about all the journalists who risk their lives and indeed lose their lives when it comes to reporting on the environment and native peoples across Latin America. I mean, it's a real. Um, it, it, in Mexico, uh, it's a it's a tough beat. You know, well, the, lot, the environmental. Lots of, lots of journalists around the world. A few here in the U.S an investigative reporter for the Las Vegas Sun, which is a section of the Las Vegas Review Journal, was murdered. Uh, he was killed, and the person accused of his murder, because murder is a, only applies after a jury's uh, uh, found someone guilty. The person charged with killing him is the guy he was investigating over, frankly, petty stuff in government that uh, uh, it's shocking to think anybody would kill somebody else over that. Don Bowles of the Arizona Republic whose investigative reporting partner was my first boss at the Detroit Free Press in the mid-70s, he, um, he was uh, killed in a bombing by Arizona mobsters uh, back in 1970, uh, I think it was 75 or 74. And yeah, this guy was, uh, as you say, it was not, he was doing a kind of a series on government, uh, the Vegas guy you're talking about. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it, was, it wasn't that big of a deal, the stuff he was doing, I mean, it was corruption. But it wasn't a big of a deal. We had also the murder of uh, the journey journalist. I think his name was Chauncey Bailey in Oakland, mm -hmm. uh, maybe five or eight years ago. David, uh, to take a step to the Supreme Court uh, and another case, I wanted to ask you about this case involving religious freedom and religious accommodations. Okay, so when somebody's right. a certain faith, and you have to accommodate for that in the uh, workforce. Um, Federal law bars employers from firing workers for practicing their religion unless the employer can show that the worker's religious practice cannot reasonably, and that's, I guess, the key word in all of this, be accommodated without undue hardship. Uh, now, this case is essentially 
guy working for the Postal Service, right, a devout Christian, wanted Sundays off. And the court uh, is hearing this case because he filed a lawsuit. This is after there were accommodations made on the job. They had swapped out a bunch of shifts. They tried to accommodate the guy. But ultimately, you know, the shoe pinched hard enough that he said, no, I'm just not good with this anymore. And now it's going to the Supreme Court. Thoughts? Well, you know, there, there's an old saying that hard cases make for bad law. When this rural carrier was hired, there was no mail delivery on Sunday. The post office made a deal with Amazon to do the end of its delivery. And so need to have people on Sunday. If he were working in the main post office in a city of any size, it would not be an issue. They just put other people on duty. He'd, he'd uh, work Saturdays and other people would work Sundays. But in a rural area, they don't have that option. And the question, uh, I haven't read what's called the question presented to the court, but the core question here is, how far do you have to go to accommodate uh, his religious preference? Now, one of the things to think about in this case is let's assume the court says you have to give him Sundays off. That means someone else will have to work that Sunday shift. And to what degree does that mean an intrusion by religion into their lives? Because the First Amendment says both that you have the free exercise of religion but it also means you have the free non-exercise. Uh, if you're not a believer, if you are a believer, but you don't want to go to church, that's none of the government's business. And we have a, a concept in America called rule laws of general applicability. Uh, that means everybody has to comply with them. See, a newspaper is a First Amendment institution, but it's still a business and they have to pay taxes and comply with safety rules like everybody else. Uh, back in the early 90s, two... Uh, Washington State employees, both of whom practiced the religion of their indigenous peoples, which involved using peyote, were let go. They were denied their unemployment benefits because they were using illegal drugs. And the initial decision of the court was the correct decision. It was the laws of general applicability. But for some reason, uh, Ted Kennedy... Uh, went off the rails here along with uh, Orrin Hatch and some other senators. And they passed a law that basically said uh, the contrary to this, that the laws of general applicability didn't appear. They call it the Religious Freedom Act. And it's really the Religious Intrusion into Other People's Lives Act, in my view. And these issues are not going to go away, especially with the current makeup of the Supreme Court. Anybody who wants to minimize the... Um, the role of non-religion is going to try and find ways to get into the court. We're going to see abortion cases, Supreme Court cases over flags and free speech and uh, religious clubs at public schools and all sorts of things because the people who want to make us a theocracy see an opportunity. Uh, uh, so well put. And uh, that really does sort of help us recalibrate for this moment in time in this country's evolution. And there are other briefs being filed to the court, just as you said, by the Sikhs, by the Muslims, by, you know, there, there are a lot of religions. Right. <laughs> and as you just suggested with that native people's religion, I love that case just for how bizarre it is, you know, uh, how do you possibly accommodate all of these different religious practices while also trying to run a business, in this case, right. the post office? And, and the thing I teach my law school students in the time we spend on this issue is um, you want to revive the Aztec or Inca religion with uh, a, a sacrificial um, slayings of supposed virgins on the altar. Uh, you can go right ahead and practice that religion until the moment you lift a knife over somebody. And at that point, you've committed an assault and we can charge you. And if you actually succeed in cutting somebody's heart out, it's more than reasonable that we will prosecute you uh, for uh, uh, killing that person. Speaking of killing that person in the United States of guns, I want to ask you. United uh, States of guns, uh, I love that. I, that's what I call it. I just am, I'm astounded uh, and, and embarrassed and ashamed um, of where we've come with this country and with this uh, conversation. But I was going to ask you about the self-defense laws that are now getting reconsidered in Missouri because of this um, this shooting 
uh, of the kid, you know, um, uh, Ralph yeah, what, Yarrow. What, what happened in this country is we had a law that required you, if you could, when confronted with danger, to retreat. The reasonable thing to do is say, you know, somebody's at your front door threatening you, pull the door shut. Uh, that was your first obligation. And instead, we got these uh, what are called stand your ground laws. And we've seen some horrible crimes arise from this. The young man who was shot in the head is apparently an honor student and a talented musician. He's in the statewide youth orchestra. And he went to pick up his younger brother or brothers. He's 16, I believe went to the door of this house because he had the wrong, either he had the wrong address or he misunderstood the address, but he went to yeah, the wrong the right. door. Exactly. And, the and he presses the doorbell and this 85 year old man comes out with a gun and shoots him. Now, if he just shot him there, you'd say, okay, you know, he's 85. We don't know what his mental state is, et cetera. But according to the police report, he then opens the door, steps onto the porch, and shoots the kid in the head a second time. Now, the fact that the kid is already out of the hospital tells you either he's not a very good shot or these were very low power charges or something. I mean, that you would expect somebody shot in the head twice would be dead. Um, the, the immediate response of the police was, we don't have enough evidence to arrest this man. Uh, you know, yes, yeah, you did. And uh, this just goes to the racism that's baked into so much of our politics in this country. If it had been a black man who shot a white kid, do you think that the Missouri uh, cops would have uh, said, oh, we don't have enough grounds to arrest you? Uh, he's going to be prosecuted. Given his age, I suspect you're going to hear a lot about his mental state. That's going to be a big issue. Um, but there's a real fundamental problem with both arming people and with the stand your ground laws. And, you know, there's some videos I've seen. And I can't tell you if it was YouTube or TikTok or Reels, but videos of where uh, a couple come in to go shopping in a place like a Walmart, not necessarily a Walmart, but that kind of a store. And they're filling up their um, uh, carts. And parents with kids see these people because they have AR-15s or similar weapons slung over their backs, and they just leave their carts and leave the building. If you're a police officer and you come up to some place and there's people who are armed, you know, even if they're well intended, you as a police officer are reasonably going to be concerned. And we're going to end up at some point with people who are the do-gooders getting the good Samaritans. They just happen to be armed, getting shot and killed. This idea of arming people is insane. Nobody else in the world does it. And there was a, um, a little graphic somebody put up on uh, it was in my, one of my feeds, I think Twitter feed the other day, you know, number of children killed last year by gun violence. And it was like, you know, two in this country and eight in that one and maybe 40 in another United States, 4,000 plus. Yeah. It doesn't happen anywhere except here. And it's because we have this nutty idea that got to the Supreme Court that you have a individual right to a weapon. No. The, Supreme, the Constitution says a well-regulated militia being necessary. Now, join the National Guard, then you can have a gun when you're in the business of being a National Guardsman or woman. Uh, so true. And I think it's the leading cause of death now among children. Is it is among a, uh, uh, teenagers and young people and maybe children, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, that shouldn't it's, surprise us. I mean, how many young kids die of cancer despite all the ads you see on TV for St. Jude's and stuff? It's a very well, small yeah, but I'll tell you what, David, uh, automobile accidents were the leading cause. Yes, they and, were for and a long before. time. So, I mean, that it's not as though it wasn't a little bit of a race. Thank but, goodness uh, for Ralph Nader getting us seatbelts and real safety glass. Oh, he is one of the great Americans, in my view. Just uh, terrific. Um, well, they may rethink this uh, stand your ground law. They may. I mean, you wonder at what point it does feel as though. Uh, in Missouri, they're rethinking it a little bit, or at least they're making rumblings as though they're rethinking it. A lot of this is rhetorical, I know, but you know, it starts somewhere, I suppose. Well, the, the key to this, I think, is going to be two things, getting a, a strong majority of one party or the other. One party, we're going to say everybody's going to be armed and armed all the time, and the other party's going to say we're going to uh, reduce a weaponry out there. And the other is uh, law enforcement. Uh, when police chiefs and police unions uh, say enough, then there'll be some change here. 
Uh, I, it's, just, it's kind of amazing, Mark. Only about 10% of the public and uh, about 10% of gun owners are in favor of this anything goes, have an assault, military type assault rifle stuff. And yet we don't have the political will to, to fix this. That, that is just an astonishing development about the you know, rubber spined nature of politicians in America. People it's die for this country, and there are politicians who will not risk not getting reelected. Uh, uh, that's just cowardice. I don't know what else. Just plain, simple cowardice. Well, I mean, you you see it played out uh, in other ways as well in the manifestations of the uh, you know uh, backing Trump when you know that you know what he's doing is is lawless, is unethical, is corrupt, whatever it might be. Um, but you're right. This is life and death. You've got the population really threatened by this. It's. Uh, um, yeah, we talked about this, Gail. <laughs> ask, ask David about the shooting in upstate New York. Oh, that was the 20, with the 20, um, I'm sorry, we didn't talk about that, Gail. That was a, the mistake where the kids pulled into the driveway. And uh, this is a white, the kids are white. She's 20 years old. She ends up, the guy on the porch, I mean, as I was saying before, David, it's kind of like a, almost a stereotypical American image, you know, rural yeah. community, guy steps out on his porch, he's got a shotgun or a gun, and he fires into these people's car who had pulled up into his driveway. Again, uh, to me, it was, it, it, it sort of speaks to what know, you were talking is, about before. It's not a crime to knock on anyone's door. If someone who owns property tells you to leave, then the law says you have to leave. But th there is no crime in knocking on someone's door. Um, I, I, years ago, when I lived in Sunnyvale, uh, left my home with my uh, then, I guess, five kids, realized we'd left something, pulled into a, a driveway to turn my station wagon around and go back. And this woman came running out of the door, screaming at me that she's going to have the police arrest me. And I said, you know, what are you upset about? She said, you pulled into my driveway. I mean, there are people with nutty views. And if they've got guns, you really need to be concerned about it. But Mark, I want to make sure I tell your audience one thing. Um, yes, I thought sir. it would be up by now. But um, uh, within a half an hour, we should have up a DC report, I thought it'd be up already, a piece I have about an annual fraud called Tax Freedom Day. And this is not Tax Freedom Day by any reasonable measure. Uh, the concept of Tax Freedom Day is uh, all the taxes for the year now have been paid if the government took 100% of the income up to this point, then the rest would be ours. And what I show is that for a, a number of people, including Donald Trump, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos, Tax Freedom Day comes about the time that the last strands of old Lang Syne are being sung. <laughs> and that for half of Americans who file a tax return, they've paid every tax they owe, state, federal, sales tax, social security, the whole ball of wax, no later than early February. This is just a gimmick, and it's dishonest, and I explain why, and uh, yet it gets promoted all the time by journalists who, oh, there's an easy story to do, who don't sure. have a clue to what they're putting on the air or in print. Wow. Well, we'll watch for that piece. I'll post it uh, on my Twitter feed, at Mark T. Live. Uh, great stuff, David. Thank you for weighing in on so many different issues. It really is terrific to have your perspective. And as this Dominion suit grinds on, I suspect next Tuesday when we visit, there'll be even more. So, I uh, suspect you're exactly right. <laughs> I look forward to that. David K. Johnston, enjoy your mug, David K. Johnston. Yeah. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped. And please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.